Vong. Giants, often categorized in the genre of tall tales or something you would see on a silver screen, we all know giants are not real, or are they? Over the last couple of decades, leading researchers have come to discover some astounding evidence and stories that could suggest giants did exist and could prove to be quite an obstacle for Darwinist and scientific communities. If giants did exist, it solidifies the stories of giants in the Bible and the biblical prophetic narrative. Several years ago, Steve Quayle, the leading expert in giant research, broke a wild story about a giant that was killed in Afghanistan. He interviewed the pilot who flew out the giant body in a military C-130. The story was highly covered on the internet and on Coast to Coast with George Norrie, popular radio host. Back in December of 2008 LA, Steve Quayle was on the program as he's been so often and he brought us that pilot anonymously. Pilot did not want his name disclosed and he talked about this very bizarre story of how he flew this dead giant out to some base in Ohio. D describe exactly what you saw. Well, when we came up, uh, basically came outside, uh, we had a normal uh, 463L pilot loaded down with uh, what they told us was a giant. Ilay Marzulli, another highly regarded researcher of the Nephilim or giants, is considered an expert. Watchers 10, his documentary production, is the culmination of those years of research L.A. has dedicated himself to prove the facts are real. His director of Watchers, Richard Shaw, has also done extensive interviews on topics like UFOs. On one of those interviews, he spoke with a caller who was in special forces in Afghanistan back in 2002. After the interview, Richard Shaw spoke to the man who called in and it became very clear he was one of the men who shot and killed the giant of Afghanistan. Then later, L.A. happened to meet another Special Forces soldier who could confirm these stories. Neither of the men wished to reveal their identity, but were willing to be interviewed by L.A. because they felt the world needed to know the truth. You were in Afghanistan in 2002, and you were called into a very remote section of Afghanistan because a patrol um, had basically gone missing. Exactly. Okay, exactly. There's no well, villages around, around nothing. for miles. Right. right. So very remote. remote. Yeah, very remote. So we flew in. They're about four clicks, kilometers. We're hiking through the same area where they were supposed to make one of their checkpoints, you know, one of their rally points. And before we left, there was all kinds of what happened with the ambush. But that was even odd because at the point of ambush, we called for maybe close air support or something, okay? okay? There was no calls made. We just off the, off the bridge. So we're coming down a, a mountainside, and there was a nice, nice path, a goat path. As we bent around this corner, you could see this opening of the cave. There's a cave. If we're coming around, and then I see there's a lot of rocks, which is another oddity, and then bone matter. When I'm not close enough to identify what kind of bones, but I did see something I knew was a piece of our communication equipment. So instantly, we're thinking ambush, maybe animal, you know, could be anything. And there was enough room in front of this cave, but it had a sheer drop off. But there was enough room that we actually got into a decent dispersal in case of the ambush. You see something coming out of the cave, and it's moving with a speed and agility that catches you off guard. Everybody. Everybody. And he comes out. It was a man at least 12 to 15 feet in height. This is a monster, red beard, and his hair was long past the shoulder, a scarlet red, and Dan runs at him, starts shooting, which broke all of us into the reality. Because it was so, so now, real. now your training is kicking. Oh yeah, okay. muscle memory, right. complete muscle memory. While Dan is moving at him, another bro of mine's laying down fire and I start firing. He skewers Dan. He's now got him on this pipe. They went through. And he's still got him. And he's coming after more. We all just clicked in. I don't know what it was, but I remember we're all like, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. Weapons components were in four. 
We have three lanes. And we have barricades. This is sounding longer than it took. We're talking 30 seconds. And he's taking multiple hits. And he's still moving. He talked about this giant being 1,100 pounds, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet long, uh, and it was killed. It was uh, apparently shot uh, somewhere in a cave in Afghanistan, uh, and, uh, but before it was shot, it lunged at uh, several of our troops, our soldiers, it may have even gorged somebody. Uh, it was just a bizarre, bizarre story, and it just sounds like the Nephilim from the Bible, doesn't well, I, it? I, we, that's why we're so fascinated by this. Out in the boonies, running around looking for high-value targets. Correct. And we're doing those operations, and uh, as we're getting into firefights, we're getting into different uh, scrimmages, you want to put it that way, we would come back to the base and we started hearing this rumor about a unit that killed uh, this, what they started calling this really tall person. At first I didn't think anything of it, and come to find out that the uh, person that they killed actually was three times the size of a man, had extra digits on their hand and digits on their feet and had red hair and uh, a special unit had come in and wanted this uh, target. Well, we'd heard that they were, had killed this thing inside a cave or the mouth of a cave. And uh, it was common knowledge among the military to hear this. And when you say- It is. Our contact said 2002 is when they had, they shot this, this 15 footer or taller. And you're now in, in, in this, you know, in the service around 2005. This word has gotten out. And what I find interesting here too, is that if you're gonna create a hoax, I get that, but you've got details, six fingers, red hair, double rows of teeth, six digits on the toes. And of course that brings it right back into what we hear about in the biblical prophetic narrative, specifically the Nep. And, and even going to Iraq myself and, and being near Hadith Dam and knowing, seeing the prisoners underneath the, the, the dam and, the prisoners would scream and there'd be this awful feeling underneath the dam and then later finding out in the Bible that um, angels locked underneath there were talks about. And this Haditha Dam is the Euphrates. Is Euphrates, correct. And an angel supposedly locked underneath the Euphrates, correct. which is released in the book of Revelation. Right. Bizarre. So you're actually at this site and soldiers are being locked in prison underneath the Haditha Dam, Correct. and they're freaking out. Yeah, they're freaking out. They said they could feel it. In fact, the uh, people who would guard them would, uh, they would draw straws to see who would actually take them. No one, no one wanted to go down. Nobody wants to go down. Going back to Afghanistan, we would hear these things. We would hear the locals talk about rumors of these giants. What would the locals say? How would they talk about it? They say that they lived in the caves and they would eat people. And uh, they were cannibals. They were cannibals. And we, at the time, chalked it up to our United States as Bigfoot. And we realized that every culture had some kind of folklore, but to actually all of a sudden hear that a military unit had killed something. Dan was dead. Okay. And, uh, why is a good man, probably one of the best men I know, now dead? Before I'd left, they were already starting what they call a nine line, which is a medevac request. They're sending out a medevac request, then all of a sudden it's not a medevac request. All of a sudden we had a helicopter show up, because like I told you, it was a large precipice and a sheer drop. So the helicopter just came up from the drop. They had dropped netting, which is like a cargo netting. It's like squares. We were told we had to bundle him up. And we get another bigger helicopter. But it's almost like a jolly green giant used to look back in the day that could get, you know, through this area. Because the mountains, you gotta remember, Chinooks could only go in certain places because they had enough lift. And uh, so we got him on there. The thing was too big, we couldn't move it. It smelled worse than a skunk. A corpse that's been around for a while the hills of Afghanistan. Uh, how many troop members are you with? We had uh, six on my crew. And when you say hills of Afghanistan, uh, for us, we did not fly into the wilderness. We actually flew into a base. 
Uh, I guess this thing was transloaded out of the uh, mountains by a CH-47. But I could see that it did have the six fingers. I remember taking my foot up and placing it up next to its foot, and it was extremely large. We estimated at about 12 feet, give or take. Uh, what I can tell you is the weight of the thing, basically, it was approximately 1,500 pounds when it was getting on the aircraft. Now, if you take away the pallet weight and all the rigging that we had to uh, hold this thing down, we figured it was around uh, 1,100 pounds. Of course we're upset. That's a given, okay? We lost a very good guy. But add to that, <clears throat> you're discussing something that even in our after action report, they're saying rewrite it. And we had to rewrite it the way they wanted. How, how many fingers? Six, all oh, six, 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 six toes. Six six toes. toes. And the nails were weird because if you see somebody that ever has I don't know what it's called, but it's like a fungus, on, fungus the on the nails, how they get pointy and they're like gnarly. That's, That's what they look like. We stationed or deployed to Qatar. It was a completely normal mission for us. We were not alerted for anything abnormal. It was in the middle of the day. Uh, I remember uh, coming in. To we opened the doors and unloaded the equipment that we had brought in, uh, and then we were met at the aircraft by uh, what we later on called the babysitters, but uh, they kind of introduced themselves and said, hey, no cameras, uh, nobody's taking pictures here, we're uh, moving some high value stuff. Uh, when the load got there, uh, we're very, of course, uh, curious to see what it was, because that's just the way you are when you're told that you're not allowed to have uh, a camera. Uh, they say this thing had been dead for maybe a day or two, uh, and it was basically a dead guy, and this guy was extremely large. And when I say large, uh, our pallets are basically, if I remember correctly, about 9 by 12 feet or so. This guy was laying in a fetal position on the pallet, uh, so he, and he filled the pallet. Uh, we estimated his size at approximately 12 to 10 feet tall. Uh, I did see his skin color. I was expecting somebody of more Arabic descent, uh, being in Afghanistan and all. I know he was dead, but he was very pale, very white guy. Uh, we questioned the babysitters of, hey, where'd you get this guy? And uh, some of the army guys there with him uh, relayed to us that uh, this guy had, I guess, been living up in the mountains uh, next to a village where the villagers basically treated him like a god. I did infer that they were uh, making sacrifices to this guy because they said he was, they found bones of people. The giant supposedly, like I said, I was not there, supposedly killed the first team that they came across. He was extremely big and fast and agile for a guy that size. They sent up another team and when the second team went in there to get him, supposedly he had already started to basically eat on the team that, uh, that had been killed the first time. They then grabbed a helicopter and the helicopter brought him down where we picked him up. After we loaded the Giant, it was just a standard, uh, standard mission back. We took him all the way back to uh, Al Udin, Qatar, where he was transloaded onto a, another airplane. I believe it was a C-17. Uh, I was done with my mission then. I got away from it. I was done. I did ask some questions later of, you know, where it might have gone. And as the grapevine goes, it was probably taken back to the United States. And the words I heard were right pat. But again, I don't know. Several years after my uh, deployments to Afghanistan, something very strange happened to me um, that is somewhat related to this. I was uh, basically TDY to Kirtland Air Force Base, which is out in Albuquerque. Uh, I was out with my JAG at the time, and there was a uh, Navajo Native American uh, sitting basically in the restaurant that we're in. It was also a bar. It was actually Kelly's, uh, Kelly's Brew Pub. And uh, this Native American guy, out of nowhere, he was talking to us, very friendly guy. And out of nowhere, he asked me if I knew what a Native American sing was. And um, no, I didn't at the time. I do now, because I looked it up. But uh, he says, I, I have to sing for you. And he put his hand on me and started a Native American prayer, if you will. And I thought, wow, this is very strange. Uh, but it was cool as well. My 
my uh, Jack that I was with actually took out her uh, her Apple uh, iPhone and started to film it, and he stopped and said, no, no, not on film, not on film. And he, she put it away, and he sang the prayer, and here's where it gets very strange. He started talking about, did I know that there were giants out in the Sandia Mountains? And he said, they're out there in the mountains still, and the earth had swallowed them up. And he goes, watch out. He says, someday they're going to come back. They're going to come back. And he said something like, if I remember correctly, like the earth had swallowed them up, but soon the earth will spit them back out. And soon, he said, soon, they're coming.